to start off these lectures on organismal biology in Biology 111, I want to take the concepts that were introduced to you in the context that was presented to you around our cabin and bears and the things that interact with bears to illustrate the nature of ecological complexity and how the study of ecology is in essence the attempt to unpack and understand that complexity. And what I want to do is I want to start from a quote by a famous ecologist. You might, of course, think of him as a famous evolutionary biologist, but he had an incredibly important role in understanding ecology as well, and that is Charles Darwin. So in the very end of his book, The Origin of Species, he has a paragraph that starts like this. It is interesting to contemplate a tangled bank, clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing in the bushes, and various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth. And reflecting that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other and dependent on each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by the laws acting around us. Now we're going to return to this quote and look at the rest of it later, but for now let's just talk about that ecological complexity and attempt to understand the way biologists, that is ecologists, understand that complexity. Now I said I wanted to illustrate this ecological complexity by giving you a reference of observations made at my cabin in northern British Columbia. Interactions between various organisms there like moose and bears and salmon and all kinds of other organisms that interact with them and we'll see more of them in subsequent lectures as well. So first let's take a look at some of those flavors of ecology as you will. So one of those is behavioral ecology, which is in essence the study of animal behavior in relation to the environment. It's not just the behavior of animals in a zoo or, or in a lab. It's them in the environment and why they do those behaviors in the way they do. Now I'm going to talk about behavioral ecology by making reference to bears and how they forage and make choices about what it is that they're going to eat. In particular, which salmon they're going to choose to eat at a particular time and in a particular environment. Then we're going to continue uh, a little bit later on to talk about population ecology, which is the study of demographics, that is births and deaths, in relation to the environment. So how does the environment shape the numbers of organisms produced in a given year, the number that die in a given year, and how does that then influence the age structure and dynamics of populations? And I'm going to leverage two things we talked about in those introductory materials from my cabin to discuss this population ecology. And those are the population cycles of pink salmon and lynx. Yet another form of ecology is community ecology, and that's the study of interactions between species in relation to the environment. So I'll take these species here and weave them together into this into a network of interactions that can be discussed in the context of food web and talk about how those interactions can impact that entire food web. And that's where we're going to start, in fact. And then finally, we're going to talk about ecosystem ecology, which is, in essence, uh, the study of the flow and flows of energy and matter through both the biotic and abiotic components of the ecosystem. And for that, I'm going to talk about nitrogen limitation that I introduced in the introductory video by making reference to very small patches of nitrogen enrichment brought by the urea of animals. Okay, so let's start with community ecology. Now, the network of interactions among organisms in a particular community can be understood as a framework of who eats who. Uh, and eating being referred to generically as obtaining matter and energy and nutrients from. Now, when I gave this lecture last year, I asked the students to build a food web that they thought represented the network of interactions that I had discussed in the introductory materials. And here is one of the uh, networks that was built by a student in that class. And it represents the different organisms that I had videos for and shows which is consuming the other via the arrow. So you have grasses that are getting their energy from the sun, and then you have a bunch of things that are feeding on the grasses and trees, and then predators that are feeding on those. So let's take this food web and first just point out some of the different types of ecological interactions. For example, predation is where one animal is 
preying on and consuming another animal. And so you have uh, weasels that are feeding on red squirrels, you have wolves that are feeding on snowshoe hares, and lynx that are also feeding on snowshoe hares, wolves are feeding on moose as well, and grizzly bears are feeding on and scavenging salmon. Those are just a few of the predatory interactions in this network. Another type of ecological interaction that pe people put a lot of emphasis on is competition between organisms for shared resources. So in this representation here, you can see both wolves and lynx are consuming snowshoe hares. So if the wolves consume more snowshoe hares, that's fewer available for the lynx, which might then impa impact the population of lynx and lynx behavior. Further, you can think about mutualisms, that is, uh, interactions between species that benefit both of those species. And in the introductory video, you saw that many berries want to be eaten by um, animals because they're an important dispersive agent for the seeds of that, of that plant. And then finally, uh, you have parasitic interactions where one organism lives on and obtains benefits from another organism without directly killing it. And I'm not going to talk about that directly in this lecture, but you'll see it in a subsequent lecture where I talk about parasitoid wasps influencing bark beetles in the context of climate change. On these food webs, you can also think about some different categories of organism that represent the nature of their interactions with other organisms, in particular who they consume or what they consume. And so here you have primary producers that are things that obtain their energy from the sun. In other ecosystems, primary producers can sometimes uh, receive inputs from chemical sources, such as um, from hot vents on the bottom of the ocean. Now, there are a series of consumers which are feeding on other organisms, so they're not obtaining their energy directly from something like the sun, but rather they're feeding on things that have done so, sometimes several steps removed. Now, several of these consumers can, of course, be carnivores, so in this case you have weasels and wolves and lynx, they're strictly carnivores. They really only feed on other animals. You also have the herbivores, like snowshoe hares and moose, which really only feed on plants. And then you have things that feed on a diversity of different food types, including animals and plants, insects, animals, plants, fungi, uh, all kinds of different organisms. And so in this food web, red squirrels, but especially bears, grizzly bears, or brown bears, and black bears. And we're going to spend a lot of time on those in the rest of this lecture to illustrate the concepts. Finally, you have decomposers, which are breaking everything down, and I don't have a representation of those in here, but a lot of insects will break down things, and in particular, bacteria and fungi will break down other organic matter and recycle it into the system. Here are some pictures or videos that I've taken over the years where the bear, the grizzly bear in the upper left is feeding on plants and then you have one that's feeding on red osier dogwood berries. On the bottom they're feeding on skunk cabbage. And this bear on the upper right is foraging for salmon whereas the one on the bottom right is scavenging a moose that has been killed by hunters. Now here's a representation, a more formal representation of uh, one particular population of grizzly bears that's well studied and that is the Yellowstone grizzly bears and all of the different food types that they're feeding on at different times of the year. So this means that bears are generalists overall, they're generalist consumers, but importantly they're also specialists at certain times and places. So this then is trying to, organisms trying to make decisions about what it is they're going to eat, which is one of the realms of behavioral ecology. How are animals behaving in relation to the environment? And so this question, how do animals decide what to eat and why do they eat what they do eat, is often context in the, is often placed in the context of something called optimal foraging theory. Where the hypothesis basically is, is that animals should eat foods that maximize their energy intake. The presumption is that energy is limiting for most organisms and so you really need to focus in on the things that give you the most energy Otherwise, you're not going to be able to survive and reproduce and um, continue on your genes into the next generation. So that's the hypothesis, but there's many things to consider here that behavioral ecologists have increasingly done within their studies of foraging. And these include things like how abundant are the different prey types. So it's not just about how energy rich they are, but you also have to think about how abundant are they, 
uh, how easy are they to catch, catchability, and what is their quality with respect to other things like energy density or limiting nutrients or things like that. So I want to talk about foraging by bears on salmon and here are a bunch of pictures of uh, dead salmon that I've encountered that have been eaten by bears. In the upper left it's a sockeye salmon. On the right you have a chum salmon and on the bottom left you have pink salmon which are the ones that figured in the introductory video. Now to talk about bears foraging on salmon I wanted to take you to Alaska because that is where I've actually done some work on this topic. And so uh, we're going to go to the Wood River Lake system in uh, southeast Alaska where I worked for 10 summers uh, as a graduate student before I became a professor attempting to understand the behavior and distribution and dynamics of sockeye salmon and one of the important contributors to that is the bears that eat them. And so let's focus in on the Wood River Lakes here. Here's a picture of me in the upper left uh, at a place called Nurka, Lake Nurka. And in the background on the upper left, you have the creek that I worked in, which was called Pick Creek. In the lower left, you have a, a picture of that creek. It's about two kilometers long, and I could survey the entire length of that creek every day, keeping track of all of the salmon in it based on when they'd arrived in the creek and then when they died after they used up all of their energy. Uh, and then I could figure out how they were dying and when the bears were killing them. And indeed, there was a family of bears that I saw every single day on that creek and I had a lot of fun interactions trying to get them to leave the creek when I would go by to do my survey uh, and sometimes they didn't take it so well. This is uh, a, an encounter I had by myself at midnight uh, under the, the midnight sun um, where this, this mother bear, this was the fifth time she'd seen me that day and she really didn't want to leave the creek. When bears are confronted by all of these salmon in the stream, they have to make a decision on what to eat. They don't just eat at random. Now, one of the reasons that it's important to make these decisions is that different salmon in the creek will have different energy rewards for the bears. So, for example, when the, when the salmon first enter the creek, remember they gain their energy in the ocean, then come back into fresh water, during which time they're no longer feeding, and then they do all of their reproduction based on stored energy in the stream, using up that energy as they're spawning, and then within three weeks, they all die. So during that period, they use up the energy they have stored within them and they become much less valuable for the bears. So here's some work we did showing that when the fish just get into the creek, they look like this nice fresh male here and they have lots of energy in them. That's a very high energy density. But three weeks later when they're dead, such as these guys on the lower right here, you see that they have only about half the energy they had when they started. So all else being equal, it's much more, it's much better for a bear to kill a fresh newly arrived energy rich salmon than one that's been there for a long time and is not very energy dense. So that's the prediction then is that bears should eat the newest that is newly arrived in the stream most energy rich salmon. But there's a hitch in this uh, in this story here and that is that when the catching's easy like on the lower right the bears can just walk up and grab whatever salmon they want and eat it choose the energy rich ones but if the water is deeper, such as on the left there, the salmon, the bears will have a hard time catching the salmon. They can't just go up and pick and choose and grab out the most energy rich one. So this is catchability differs among locations and it differs between newly arrived fresh fish and later arrived dying fish. The modified prediction then is that they should eat the newest, most energy rich fish, but only in places where the catching is easy. Otherwise, they should just catch what they can because otherwise they won't even fill their stomach. Okay, so we tested that prediction back in the Wood River Lakes you can see here in two different locations. One place where the catching was easy and that's Hanson Creek down here. And we're going to compare that to the creek where I did most of my work, which is Pick Creek, which is considerably deeper and the bears can't just walk in and pick whatever fish they want. So we would expect at Hanson Creek, they're really going to target the energy rich fish but in Pick Creek, they might actually target the energy poor fish because they're easier to catch. They can't get away as easily because they've used up all their energy. So indeed, we found that bears killed younger, fresher fish at the very small Hanson Creek. So here is the average predation rate on fish of a given age in the stream. So the fish over here just got in the stream and they're really energy rich and the bears have a high predation rate on them. And then as time goes by, as the average age of the fish is older, 
then the bears uh, have much lower predation rate on them. They just kind of ignore them. In Pick Creek, however, where uh, the bears can't catch a fish so easily, the predation rate is very low on the newly arrived fish because they can get away. But it increases as the fish get older because they can't get away. They've lost all their energy and they're not good at avoiding the bears. So bears really are choosing the most energy rich foods that they can get, but that's heavily nuanced by a series of factors such as how catchable the fish are. Other factors that influence um, optimal foraging or foraging generally that are the purview of behavioral ecology include things like competition. So sometimes you'll have multiple bears on the same stream. This is uh, Brooks Lake in Alaska, where a whole bunch of bears congregate on a waterfall. And when you have large numbers of bears there, they often have to partition their locations depending on dominance. And in particular, when this bear walked out here, the whole place cleared out because this bear was the big badass bear that would dominate everybody else and nobody wanted to deal with him. Other complications include predation risk. That is, if you are yourself afraid of getting killed while you're foraging, that will influence how you forage. So there's this really cool uh, study that, where they manipulated the fear of predation in the intertidal zone by uh, foraging by raccoons in the intertidal zone when they were scared of getting attacked by dogs. Uh, the raccoon foraging on a bunch of things in the intertidal, which then have effects on other critters, uh, but they're scared of dogs running around, and I guess before that it would be wolves and coyotes and foxes and things. And so what they did was they played the, the sound of a dog barking and then saw what happened, how that modified raccoon foraging. And here are a series of uh, responses where it shows in the blue um, where there's no playback of the predator through loudspeakers. And on the right, there's a playback of the predator. And you can see that the, the raccoons have an immediate response. That is, they uh, reduce their foraging. And that also lasts for longer. It's not just in the time when they're hearing the call. And then that has a whole series of cascading effects on the predation rate on a whole series of organisms within the intertidal. There's many other complications that influence how organisms make decisions about what they're foraging on that's studied in behavioral ecology. And another one is that there are certain nutrients found in certain locations that make animals seemingly do paradoxical things, such as uh, a series of macaws here and other parrots that will feed on the clay banks in the Amazon and other places in the tropics. Particular things that they need to maintain themselves that aren't just about energy.